The Biden ballot fix hits a wall and turmoil at the state teachers retirement system. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. In Alabama, the deadline to qualify for the November ballot came before the Democratic National Convention. So President Biden would miss the deadline for about, by about two weeks. It would not appear on the ballot. So last week, the Alabama legislature, dominated by Republicans who likely support Donald Trump, moved the deadline. The Senate vote was unanimous. The House vote was unanimous. And the Republican governor signed it. No problem. Meanwhile, here in Ohio, Biden remains off the ballot because of the same problem. Democrats and Republicans thought they had an easy and permanent solution. Then the Senate passed a bill that added a last-minute provision that Democrats hated, and House Speaker Jason Stevens declined to bring it up for a vote. So, Laura Bischoff, Biden still remains off the ballot. This looked like a great fix. It was a permanent deadline fix and a, and a contingency for conventions. But then there was a poison pill, as they call it, put into that bill. Right. Some of this ties back to the fact that the House and the Senate, uh, there's a big fight over who's going to be the speaker in the next session. Um, and uh, the, the, the Senate, under Matt Huffman, who wants to be speaker next session, um, put in this uh, element into their, they called, the Democrats called it a poison pill, saying that non-citizens wouldn't be allowed to contribute to ballot issue campaigns. Uh, they're already not allowed to contribute to candidate campaigns. And um, Democrats had an issue with this. They felt like it just put up another hurdle to getting to the ballot. And if you think about it, the ballot is a place where Republicans tend to lose. Um, on issue questions. On yeah. issue questions, yeah. right. I mean, if you can't get the legislature to move on something, sometimes the, the, the path is to go to the ballot and the voters say yes. Well, it, it seemed like the governor said last week this is sure. going to get fixed. Matt Huffman said it's going to get fixed. Jason Stevens said it's going to yeah. get fixed. It still ain't fixed. No, it still ain't fixed. And, you know, the Democrats showed what their priorities are, which was they want to be able to keep this untraceable foreign dark money for their ballot issues uh, rather than put Joe Biden on the ballot. So, I mean, they set the priorities. Their priority was to keep that money, to keep that foreign money coming in. They also know that they can always go to the court. Um, you know, that's what Donald Trump had to do because both Colorado and Maine legislatures didn't rush to try to put him on the ballot. So he had to go to court to get on those ballots. So Biden may have to do the same thing. But now on the uh, couldn't the legislature with Republicans dominating both houses in the governor's office do the foreign contribution to issues campaigns separately? Why does it have to be with this one? Mike? In politics, it's called compromise, okay? And no, that's, you know, it's compromise, but the Democrats didn't want to compromise. The exact talking point you just used is the venom from the poison pill. They did this on purpose because they wanted to get a bad... money. They wanted to get a... our state. No, they wanted to get a bad vote or have some kind of, you know... No, they want to stop the foreign money from coming in. That's why they did it. I think the vast majority of Ohioans just wanted Republicans to put... Joe Biden on the ballot and let them make the decision. This Republican legislature won't let people make decisions, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're the candidate that had the worm eating his brain or anybody else, they deserve that right. Well, Brian, if you're not allowing foreign money to come in for candidates' campaigns, why should it be allowed in for issues' campaigns? I, I don't even know that that's the major issue. I think the major issue... No, that issue, is the major no, issue. No, it isn't. The yes, major it is. issue is you slip something in at the last minute because you're just trying to complicate this issue. The courts will decide this. They're going to decide it. They shouldn't have to. Why is it that the legislature can act like the vice principal of every high school that already bans cell phones and spend their time on that, but they can't let Ohioans vote for if president? the Democrats weren't so focused on getting all that money in this state, flooding this state, that's why... Why Alabama you was able to pass it because their state's not you getting flooded when this get to the foreign court, Laura. So, Laura, the next step, what is the next step? The, the Thursday was supposed to, it was the deadline, so you didn't need an emergency clause to get this settled before Election Day or the deadlines for ballots. Um, they could do it. They could pass it next week or in another session, or they could go to court, which is more likely. Well, if they pass it next week or another session later on, they'll need an emergency clause, which requires a higher vote threshold. Given that this all came off the rails this week, Without the emergency clause, I don't see that actually happening. Um, I'm not really sure what the mechanism is to go to court. Um, another option that's been discussed is like 
to have the DNC actually do the nomination ahead of time before the, the, con the convention actually starts. I mean, is this ultimately the Democrats' fault for not checking on Alabama's deadline or Ohio's deadline, Well, no, the Republicans have done it, too. It's just that things are so toxic in Ohio, even Alabama can resolve this, but we can't resolve it here. They have supermajorities. This is a Republican effort to not do this. Governor DeWine was even embarrassed. Governor DeWine even said this will be resolved and Joe Biden will be on the ballot. Is there a chance... Like it blew back in the in the progressives and the liberals and Democrats' faces when Colorado and Maine sure. tried to keep Trump off the ballot. Could this blow back on Republicans here? And you, and re if Republicans are trying to keep Joe Biden off? The ballot? No, because the Republicans here in Ohio actually said Joe Biden should be on the ballot. Okay, it, it, they're not saying that he shouldn't be on the ballot. The Democrats in both Maine and Colorado said. Trump should not be on the ballot. We don't want him on our ballot. The Republicans are not saying that in Ohio about Joe Biden at all. Yeah, you, yeah they did. They no, didn't no, no, they the didn't. It's a big difference, they Brian. Come on. They didn't right. pass the it's just that you guys don't want to give up all that money to get him on the ballot. Oh, come on. All right, well, enough drama there. There's more drama. The Ohio State <laughs> Teachers Retirement System controls about $90 billion to pay for the financial futures of a half million retirees and current teachers. A long simmering feud is breaking wide open. The battle is between so-called reformers on the STRS board. The reformers say they are looking for better returns on their investment. Their opponents say the reformers' plan is too risky. The Columbus Dispatch reports a memo accuses the reformers of engineering, quote, a hostile takeover of the system by private interests. Governor DeWine says he's worried about how the system is operating, and Attorney General Dave Yost has launched an investigation. Laura Bischoff, you have covered this for a number of years. You broke the story this week. Is this just a power struggle, or is it something more? I think it might be both. I think there is a power struggle. I think that there's um, a faction of retirees that are very upset that they've not had a sustained and ongoing cost of living allowance. Um, this was a measure instituted a few years back to help stabilize the finances of, of the uh, pension system. And that's really gotten them mad. And, and, and they're also upset that um, the investment staff get these big bonuses that teachers obviously don't get. And even in years in which they lose money. And that's kind of like a big sticking point. So they've been um, trying to flip the board. It's an 11-member board. Some are appointed. Some are elected. There's an election going on. Right now, the votes are being counted. The election results will come out on Saturday. Um, for, an act, for an, a teacher position on the board. So over the last couple of years, they've gotten more and more seats on the board, and now uh, with the return of Wade Steen, more on him in a sec, mm -hmm. uh, they have a majority uh, on the board. Wade Steen was the governor's appointee. Uh, he started under Kasich, and then DeWine reappointed him, and then DeWine about a year ago pulled him off of the board and replaced him with somebody else. Steen and the retirees mounted a legal challenge to that and won, and Steen came back in dramatic fashion in April. And this is all, this $90 billion is a lot of money, and it's, there's a lot of money to be made by the investment firms, possibly that could be returned to the teachers, but also by a private firm, whoever's running the, firm, the funds. Right, and there has been a, a group um, that emerged a few years ago saying that they have a new um, investment strategy and that they could do this with $65 billion of the, of the $90 billion. Uh, and that they could return for an extra $4 billion, rest restore the COLA, the cost of living allowance, uh, even reduce the uh, contribution rates. Um, but uh, the current investment staff said, no, that's untested. This is a new um, outfit with a, not a track record, so we don't recommend it. And that is sort of what triggered a lot of the pushback on the board. Bob, if you are not a teacher, if you're not a retiree or related to one, why should you care about this issue? Well, I mean, I think what Laura has uncovered is, like a lot of things in life, everything comes down to money. And I think the really interesting part, because I've been fo kind of following this, you know, over the last year or so, and I've always found it interesting. I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on, and Laura ended up telling us what's going on. I think it's basically this new group or these guys that came in that want to take this money and invest it um, differently. And I think they're promising all the teachers, oh, well, we'll, we'll start reinstating our cost of living because we're going to be making all of this money on our new way to invest it. And, you know, sometimes those things don't work out. So if this 
system fails, Brian, I assume it's the taxpayers who might be asked to bail it's, it out. It, there's no danger here of it failing. Mm -hmm. This is about uh, how it's managed and where it's managed. And like, where have we seen this before? There's an, uh, something in education. There's a board. The governor didn't get his way. The governor, in this case, he's arguing with Wade Steen, and in in, you know, who's another Republican. Um, and the firm actually is run by some of Josh Mandel's former folks. You know, this is all about who steers the money and how they get there. I'd be a little concerned about the governor having too much power over over this, just like I'd be a little too concerned about even the professionals over there just making this determination. There needs to be a compromise where the decision is made based on the investment and not all of this politics. All of the board members have a fiduciary duty. That means that they have to act in the best interest of the system, not based on you know their own personal interests or whatever. And so that's the, the crux of what uh, um, Attorney General Yost will be looking at, is whether or not they violated their fiduciary duty. That's a pretty, he can actually sue them to remove them from the board. It's a, yeah, there's a that's law. a pretty extreme step, but it's not easy it's to do. It's never been taken before. Yeah. Um, it's never been taken before, and, it, and they'd have to violate their fiduciary duty. It would be a civil case, and Attorney General Yost would have to prove it in court. And by the way, this firm was denied the contract at one point, from what I understand. I don't have a, uh, uh, my understanding of GS, whatever that, that that one point they didn't move forward on. Oh, QED, yeah. QED, they didn't, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, I mean. QED is the firm they think yeah. is too risky, too untrue. Correct, yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing that has just come out today is the Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, is going to start investigating the money that was invested in these board elections and where it was coming from because the reformers have had all this so, mailings so and what everything. You're telling me is that once again, somebody doesn't like a board they don't control involved in education, and then the no, governor jumps in, and well, then Dave no, Yost no, jumps no, no, no. in, has, and somebody else Brian, jumps in. This has in. to do with there was a whole yeah. during the campaigns, they have to report their expenditures just like Correct. any other campaign. That did not happen. There was this big fixmypension.com group and save Ohio STRS group. And they did mailings and they did um, but nobody, messaging, but, but no one looked into it until now. Well, I we did. I mean, I didn't know any of this till Laura's story, Do other, which makes perfect sense. Uh, so where the, was the is Oprah's the, or a any other you know any of the police and fire retirement systems? Are they any of theirs? They face similar situations. How have their returns been? Have they been able to maintain the cost of living increases? Why are the teachers in so much turmoil? I'm not sure why SCRS isn't providing a COLA like some of the other funds are. I mean, all of the funds have been under a lot of stress. They have to, um, you know, meet their return, their expected annual returns. Um, and it's, it's a system. In Ohio, public employees don't pay into Social Security. This defined benefit pr um, program out of the five pension systems are, is the only retirement they have. Yeah. Retirement plans have to be... It can't be too risky, no. Because you've got to maintain all yeah. this. There is, there they have to pay these benefits. It's not like, and it's and it's the group benefits, not an individual benefit. So they, return on investment can be tricky to. to yeah, and and that's going to be the crux of the matter here. Is is this should this new firm come in and should they take over the investment of the STRS fund and. Yeah, great if they can do it and get a great return and they can do cost of living. But once again, what happens if it doesn't work and they lose money? I, I, don't, How think, does that... I don't think it's even going to happen. I mean, this, this term ends in a few months. They're doing the So the other right thing now. is, like, under state law, the pension systems are required to invest as a prudent person, the prudent person standard. They're also required to diversify. So putting $65 billion or two-thirds of the money into one particular investment strategy may run afoul with those Was laws. that what they were requiring? That That's what new they were firm? suggesting. They were yeah. suggesting. Wow. In the okay. Yeah. Okay. Complicated. More to come. Students have left the Ohio State University campus for the summer and campus protests over the war in Gaza have largely ended. Some three dozen protesters still face misdemeanor trespassing charges after a campus protest a couple of weeks ago. This week, Attorney General Dave Yost notified Ohio College presidents that students who wear masks at the protest face possible felonies. He says they could be violating a law that makes it illegal to wear a mask while committing a misdemeanor crime. Some of those arrested at OSU were wearing face coverings to keep their identities hidden. Most were wearing medical masks. 
Critics have pointed out that Yost did not issue similar warnings to members of the Proud Boys group who have protested recently at the State House and other locations. Granted, they were not charged with any crimes. The law Yost cites was enacted in 1953 and was designed to counter activities of the Ku Klux Klan. Bob Clegg, is Yost's advisory about protecting public safety, or is it pandering to conservatives upset about the, cons the uh, protests on campus? I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question, Mike. I don't know what to tell you. I do find it interesting because uh, maybe I'm the only one on this panel that can remember back to the 60s when there was the Vietnam uh, War protest. None of them wore masks. And, and I understand that they're wearing them now because they're concerned about professional retribution down the road. Well, society's much more woke now than it was back in the 60s. Um, if you really feel strongly about an issue, I don't know why you want to try to hide yourself. One difference, Brian, is there are a lot more cameras around in than they were in 1968. Everybody has a camera exactly. right now, but what and I social wish, media spreading the pictures around. I think around. this is yeah. just you know. First of all, I'll answer. It is pandering. <laughs> um, it, he he. It, the First Amendment. It, it, if it went to court, it would be overturned. We we all know that, especially the freeway sign one. I you know they can maybe argue some authority on campus depending. On, but I don't think masks uh, constitute off any offensive action. And frankly. Unfortunately, I've seen the Ku Klux Klan, as have you, in front of the State House mm -hmm. wearing their masks, sure. and I don't see any Attorney General, Republican, or Democrat that ever raised the issue. So, yeah, it's pandering. There's no other way to discuss. Do, do we know, Laura, if this uh, law has ever been used? I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, and it may predate 1953. I was told that, that 1953 is when there was a massive rewrite of the code. Oh, okay. But still, it was it was. Um, it was developed because of uh, fighting back against the KKK. I mean, like two bank robbers wearing a mask, would they, could they have been charged with this? Or was this just for protests on a public square and trespassing? I think and any, like that? any crime that's committed and you're wearing a mask, so I think any, and a lot of bank robberies now, they have a surgical masks on or whatever. Uh, they could be charged with that very same law. I don't know if anybody really knew it was out there until somebody dug into the code and started looking at it. The other uh, thing that came up this week, Brian mentioned that there's a bill that would ban uh, signs on highway overpasses and on buildings if the property owner has not given permission, a lot of electronic signs. Where does that, what about that, Bob? I, that I, uh, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. I gotta, and I understand the reasoning behind this. These are hateful signs. Yes, these banned. are anti-Semitic signs. Save the crew would be okay. Yeah, but, and, I mean, and stuff like that. Um, I don't know how you go about combating something like that without infringing on freedom of speech. Yeah. Who determines what's hateful? That's the question, right, Laura? That's the tricky part. That is the tricky part, and I, I kind of agree with Bob. I, I think that uh, it could run afoul with First Amendment. Brian, we, you know, on 315, we, at least right. once a month, we see pictures of uh, fetal remains. Right. Disturbing, no doubt. Well, Some might say it's hateful. Should those be banned? I mean, I think you're going to get into a, a difficult court determination on what is hateful and what isn't hateful. But compl complicating all of this is, and it started to happen in New York too, and some of the big cities, is the ability to actually generate uh, uh, and project onto buildings. And that's going to become an even bigger problem. Like, who, how can you find out who did it? And who is responsible? And yeah, because all you need is a, well, you only need is a phone in some right, cases to right, put yeah. it up there. Um, is, have free speech debates changed? You mentioned the 60s. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it seems like they were, I don't know, it just seems like it's a little different now. Maybe it's social media, maybe it's uh, the amount of cameras that are out there, the intensity of the political environment, but 68 certainly was intense. Yeah, it was really intense. I mean, that, that's why um, when they talk about how these protests that have happened over the last few months was, you know, like the, the most that we've ever experienced in the United States, I'm thinking back, well, no, not really. I mean, they were, they were really, really intense back then. I mean, look at Kent State. Yeah. I mean, we had four people die uh, in that protest. So uh, I don't know what it is, but I think we have to always be aware of the fact that we need to deal and let people freely express what they think. And at what point do they cross that line? And I, I'm not an attorney. I can't tell you when that is. 
finding that line, Brian, is difficult. It, it will be a difficult thing. Uh, I think that it will be tested and it will have to be tested at different points in time. But also, I think definitely it's just more visible. TikTok has changed everything. And also, who knows what money is funding some of these, spurring yeah. some of these things. Right, now, our, last, money. Our, our last topic, City School District, thus Columbus City School District, has seen its enrollment shrink sharply over recent decades. As a result, a number of school buildings are under capacity. Some schools are only 25% full. The Columbus School Board is now considering a complicated plan which would close up to 20 of the district's 113 school buildings. A superintendent's task force has submitted the plan. It has nine scenarios. The board, the school board, has tried this before, but in 2018, after months of hearings and outcry from students, parents, and alumni, the school board scrapped that closing plan. Brian Werther, I don't want to get into the details of which yeah. school will close and <laughs> no, everything no, else, no. the scenarios, but it brings out the larger issue that this is something that everyone agrees needs to be done. We've, we have far fewer students. Right. We've got to close schools. But when it comes down to the vote, it's really hard for the elected officials well, it, to do it, it. It is early in the process, and they are being transparent about it and talking about it, but not all of those schools on the list would be closed. Uh, after this, it would go to the school board, and it wouldn't happen in, until 2025, 26. The, you know, there was a Wall Street Journal article that actually came out yesterday that talked about this is not just Columbus. This is all over because of population changes and things like that. And um, big districts are having this problem. And it's absolutely a difficult decision to make. It's a difficult decision to make for politicians. And we'll just see, have, to, have to see how this plays out as they go through this process. But I do think they're doing it in a different way. It's not as political as, it, as although it's getting a lot of attention and heat. <laughs> it's early. It's early. <laughs> it's early. It's early. And it will. But eventually we'll see how it plays out. Is this a case, Bob, where the minority truly is, you know, driving the op the reluctance to make tough decisions? Because all the taxpayers in the Columbus City Schools yeah. are probably saying, let's make let's run this district yeah. efficiently. If this school's only twenty five percent full, it shouldn't be yeah. open. But if you've got a kid there or you graduated from there, it's different. Well, that's why the worst I've always felt the worst elected position you, you could have is a school board member. I just think they are just bombarded with all these kinds of problems. I think the big problem we have here is, yeah, you're right, it's a minority, but it's, it's parents who want to keep that school close to their home. And then you have teachers, the teachers union, who if there's less schools, therefore there's going to be less teachers. And then you have the school board who is you know, responsible to taxpayers to run it as efficiently as possible. And those conflicting forces is, is the problem. There's a good layer of emotion over all of that as well. I mean, people are very involved in their local politics and their local schools. When your kid goes to a school, you're paying attention to what's going on. One of the best things that I think government has ever done is the base closing commission. Remember back in the yeah, 90s when the yeah. Cold War ended, they had this commission, yeah. independent so-called. They listed a bunch of bases that need to be closed. They said to Congress, take it or leave it, as one vote. So Congress people couldn't pick yeah. off their base. Why don't we do that more often? I mean, A school think, closure commission. I think that's kind of what they're trying to do here, and it's very transparent. Here's the, pro the only downside when you do it that way and you're that transparent about it is, a bunch of the schools that wouldn't be in some of those scenarios are also listed in those nine scenarios. So it's got more people engaged, you know. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, I think that is what they're trying to do is go about it systematically, look at the facts, then figure out what to do, and then make the decision. But you're right, there's competing interests. How about a Social Security Reform Commission for Congress? You yeah. know that's broken. It's going to run out of money. Yeah. I mean, th that I, is an issue that I don't know how it's... I'm, I worry that it only gets resolved when it collapses. And then, then we have a, you know, panic. Um, but, you know, if you try to, you know, uh, make the retirement age greater, then you're accused of trying to cut people out, but if you try to raise more money, you're raising taxes. So it's these tough issues that can never get resolved. Yeah, hard decisions are hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you summarize it. And it happens at the local, state, and, and federal level. And it's much easier to go for the shiny object or, or argue over the wedge political issue than to actually 
you know, fix or the name the post fix the fix the unemployment compensation system, or delay it for the next Person. legislative yeah. session, or the next president, or school board, <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, it's time now for our final off the record parting shots. Brian Rothberg, you're up first. So uh, I know that uh, Children's Services is going to go for a levy probably soon. They have to do a renewal, and it's uh, in Franklin County, and uh, their costs have gone up a lot, and hopefully they, they get a good uh, piece on the ballot for it. Bob. Uh, City of Columbus got some good news. Forbes magazine did their top 15 uh, major cities to live in, and Columbus ended up in 10th, and it was because of their employment rate, which was 97%, and the a median, median average uh, monthly uh, housing cost, which was lower, too. Hmm. Laura. So Bill Curlis was a longtime treasurer for Republican candidates, um, and he pled guilty uh, this week to stealing almost a million dollars over a period of years. And um, it kind of points to how politicians should adhere to an age-old adage in the newsroom, which is, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> the point is to verify. Speaking and of verifying, last week's graduation speech at OSU was different. It featured a pitch to buy Bitcoin, a magic trick with the OSU president, and two attempted sing-alongs. It turns out the speaker, Chris Pan, says he wrote it while taking drugs. My guess is that while most of us cannot remember our graduation speakers, the OSU class of 2024 will remember theirs. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Continue the conversation on Facebook. Watch us anytime at our website, wosu.org slash cotr. You can also watch us on YouTube and the PBS video app. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.